I thought it was funny that literally, yeah, the second you open it.
degrees cooler in here. I feel this is. Well, I, I can tell <laughs>
Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Christ has risen. Nothing wrong getting loud and rambunctious for Jesus once in a while. After all, we are redeemed. We don't deserve it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. There's no reason why he should have done it. He did. Praise God. Um, whoo, sweat, it's a hot one today or something. Maybe it's the, uh, it's the subject of today. Today's uh, message is reckoning. Um, and remember, I want, I want to remind you of a couple things. When we got started with uh, Isaiah, what are the first 39 chapters pretty much dealing with? Judgment. It's a long, the long, drawn-out thing. And it can get kind of heavy. I know it's all you know, studying, reading, and going, man, this is kind of... What, what can we draw out of this that's uh, something not so heavy? But remember that this is, uh, this is the scene that... Uh, but one of the other things that I failed to mention is, uh, before I go on, before I forget it again, uh, in the writing of, of Isaiah, it was written in Hebrew, and in that language, when they would write things, they didn't have the fortunes that we had, and I don't mean by, you know, piles of cash, I mean, we were fortunate in a time where, in our language, um, somebody came along and decided to break up things into paragraphs and sentences and so on and so forth, so more easily find, and even in our Bibles, it's written with numbers. So we can, you know, know the address of what we're trying to remember. Isaiah didn't have that; he just wrote. And a lot of the things that he, he writes, um, we see them as, as different, different chapters, but they're actually flowing from one message and one uh, judgment call to another. And so he's he he will do that. We'll see that when we transition from chapter 2 to chapter 3, and I wanted to mention that because it kind of stops at verse 22, and it seems like it's a little bit awkward, but it's because that's not the end of it. And so, um, in Isaiah, there are those chapters where those, that's going to happen. Um, it seems to fall in a, different, in, a, in a weird place, but it's really not. It's because there's a continuation of the thought and of what it is that God is speaking through Isaiah. So this morning, we're going to be Picking up, and we'll hopefully get through uh, verse 22. We'll go through 12 through 22. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot here, but a lot of it is um, condensed in that it's all kind of smushed together. So um, with that being said, uh, the other thing, too, to keep in mind is when God's dealing with judgment here, in this case, I want you to always really focus on this one fact. Who is these judgments against? Who are these judgments against? Who's the group that is, that is being named here? And I want you to remember that because it's important as the people of God. Because that's who he was calling these things out to. Um, there is a time when the whole world will be judged, no doubt. And some of the way that he puts these, he, he will include that. But this is primarily God addressing his people. His rebellious, disobedient, arrogant, proud people. They have turned from their God. They've done everything that they were told not to, and they're guilty. And so God has to be God. And in God being God, um, he will only rest for so long before he pours out his justice and his judgment. Um, and I say that, too, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about our country. I mean, we're not, uh, we, we, are, we were founded as a, as a Christian-minded um, people. And originally, the people that came over came to settle this, this uh, land for the purpose of the gospel. We have long since forgotten that, for the most part. Every once in a while, we get some, some refreshing and reminders that we need to turn back. And with everything that's been going on, I think it, it, is a, uh, it is a work of God. And I, it's not so much to me as I'm looking at it and hearing some, some things. I mean, there's people that may be meeting this Sunday for the first time in a couple months as the quote-unquote people of God. And I think part of what he's, he's using this, uh, you know, a lot of this hysteria. I mean, there's sickness, yes. Some people got it, some people died, yes. 
But in the numbers that they were screaming out at the very beginning, not even close. Not even close. And yet, we have these things that are happening in our country that I knew existed, but you just didn't see them as predominant as they have been of late. And it's concerning. And it should be disconcerting to us. Because you have there in California where you have to have 3,000 pastors of uh, different assemblies that are saying, look, um, enough is enough, we're going we're gonna to meet. So the church was put under a lot of this ban. And unfortunately, a lot of people just went right along with it and didn't even think twice. And that's sad. That speaks a lot. So I'm saying this as Reckoning Day. Um, it may be something that God was doing to really, you know, thin out the, get rid of some of the terrors that weren't really here to worship God to begin with. Um, I don't know. I'm just speaking. So uh, I say that because this is kind of the backdrop of what was going on here. And uh, this is pretty heavy stuff. So hopefully we'll be able to get through it uh, uh, quickly. And I want to begin by reading the very first verse, the opening of this, verse 12. Um, and remember from last week, or from two weeks ago, where we talked about in Isaiah chapter 2, where it talked about the common man has been humbled and the man of importance has been abased. And then those fateful words, but do not forgive them. Even though they've been humbled, even though they've been abased, do not forgive them. We're not talking just about the unbeliever, the, the pagan who wants nothing to do with God to begin with. We're talking about believers, or at least the people of God. For the most part, okay? So in verse 12, um, and that's why I, I named today's uh, message Reckoning Day. Now a reckoning is simply when you bring out the books and you're going to reconcile the books. Not just to make sure that they're balanced. You're going to do that. But you're balancing them with someone in other words, there's, there's an outsider that you're balancing the books with. They have to reconcile. they got to pay the price. they got to do what's got to be done. And there's a day when that's going to come. This is what this is kind of focused on. And look what it says in verse 12. It says, For the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty and against everyone who is lifted up. Again, it's not just unbelievers that are, that are being spoken of. It's the people who call themselves by God's name. That had themselves under the banner of Yahweh. So it's not just a bunch of strangers and unbelievers. And so this is important for us to understand because with the judgments of God begin in his household. That's where they begin. And so that's kind of the focus. And it's not because God is this cruel, mean deity that is capricious and one day he's angry and then the next moment he's not. No. It's because God is just. He's holy. He's righteous. He's just. And when um, the books are unbalanced, there has to be a reckoning. It has to be reconciled. And that's what I want you to, to see here is, is this is, this is uh, Isaiah speaking, um, God speaking through Isaiah and he's speaking to the people of Judah. And it says, for the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning. That should send shivers down everyone's spine when you think about it. He will have it. Um, he won't go on forever. He is patient God. Long-suffering. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank God. Praise God for that. He's patient. But he does not slumber. Nor does he sleep. He is always on the go and always on the ready. And he will have a day of reckoning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you are holy and just. If we can't pray about that, then do we even really know you? That you are holy, that you are just, and those things ought to terrify us in our sinful nature. But how just overjoyed I am, Lord, that you've given us a new identity. And all those, the new identity, the redemption that we have, the reconciliation that we have, the, um, the forgiveness that has been given and offered, paid for. 
that we, uh, Lord, have that new identity and it's all in Christ. And so we thank you, Lord. We pray that you would just show yourself in, this, uh, in these uh, words and that we would see you all the more in the glory and the wonder and the splendor of your salvation and redemption for uh, people who are lost, who were not looking for you, who were at enmity with you, but you reconciled. And there was a day of reckoning. And for the believer, that day was long ago on a cross on the hill of Calvary. And you reckoned his sacrifice was good and enough. We thank you. Father, make these things clear to us. Open up our eyes, ears, minds, and hearts to these truths in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So he begins with that. He begins with the idea um, that God will have a reckoning. Their people, his people, will have to deal with him. Now, thank God for us in the uh, New Testament. Uh, the, the New Testament tells us, Paul teaches us, that, that, that we will come before the Bema seat of Christ, the mercy seat. And that's not so much to uh, judge us in all that we've done wrong, but that's to give out rewards. That's a, that's a good thing. Why would God give anyone of us or any believer a reward? Um, because we're doing that which is unnatural to us. Because His Spirit has enabled us. And so there's that day that's coming when the Lord of Hosts, um, this, uh, this word, the Lord of Hosts, it has a military idea behind it. It is the, um, uh, it's a simple word, it's sabah. It's the Hebrew word sabah. And it literally means that which goes forth, army, war, warfare, or host. I mean, get that into your skull. That the idea here is a military one, and it's, it's a war, it's a military, it's, um, it's warfare that is going forward. Okay, it's on the move. That day has to come. It's an army, it's a host. It's a, it's a host of an organized army. It's a host of angels. Sometimes we talk about, when the Bible talks about the heavenly hosts, it's talking about the angels. Other times it's talking about the heavenly hosts, that is the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then there's other times when it's just talking about the whole creation. Um, it's the idea of war, warfare, service, going out to war. And that's why I said, this idea that God will have a day of reckoning should send shivers down our spine when we think about it. Even as a believer, when I really stop and think about it, and if we ever really stop and think about it, we're going to stand before a holy, righteous God. That, in one sense, terrifies me from my human perspective, from my human nature. And it puts to at test, and it puts to test the idea, of, did Jesus really do it? Is it enough? Was it enough? And when I read, thank God that I can read what's written, and it is written, it was enough. And they did indeed pay for it all. But there's that moment where God will do this, and it's going to be this militaristic idea. And the idea here is no one will escape. When a military comes in and overtakes a city, no one in that city is removed from the consequences of that. Right? They all have to suffer underneath that new military that's come out and overpowered them, overtaken them, besieged them. They're at the mercy of this army. This is the idea that will happen. And he's talking about his people. Those who should have been obedient. Those who said that they would and then they wandered. And in this case, it wasn't, if you remember from a few weeks ago, probably about well, almost a month ago now, um, if you remember, they were... They were uh, syncretists. They had become syncretists. They were trying to worship God at the same time as trying to worship all these other gods and all these, doing all these other things. And they were trying to syncretize it as if God didn't know, if he didn't understand. And you're going to see that as we, as we go here. So Isaiah is calling out that there is a day of reckoning. It's going to be militaristic in its idea to go forth and to wage war. 
um, that's uh, um, more or, or another part of the uh, the idea is that's that's what he's going to do. He's gonna he's gonna get his enemies before him, um, and then he says, and uh, he's doing this against everyone who is proud. Everyone who is proud. Um, I want you to remember in the book of Matthew where uh, Jesus talks about um, this scene where these people come up to the throne, to the king, and Jesus um, presents this, this horror, horrific idea. It's terrifying. And he makes a distinction between the goats and the sheep. And to those who are not his, he says, as... as to as many as you did not do these things to my brethren. You're not mine. And they said, what did they say? But Lord, didn't we do? Didn't we do? Didn't we do all these things? Didn't we do this and feed the hungry and, and uh, do all this stuff and do this religious thing? And didn't we do this, all this stuff in your name? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Depart. And the other ones that he commended, he says, as, as much as you did these to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And they're like, when did we do that? You see, the difference is, someone on the one side is expecting God to give something in return. They have an expectation. And I've talked about that before on, on Sunday mornings when, uh, and sometimes on Wednesday nights when we put our expectations on God. It's a dangerous thing. I've seen it happen a lot. I see it happen a lot. I see a lot of people that put their expectations on God and they just think to themselves and they build themselves up with this idea that, well, if I just do this and check off all these things that I should be doing, and check off the things that I shouldn't be doing and make sure that I'm not doing them, then God will. That's dangerous. As I've said before, this isn't a quid pro quo. This isn't, this isn't you do this and I'll do that type thing. It's, I'm going to save you so that you can do what is unnatural. So that you can do what is supernatural. I'm going to super... Uh, naturally intend that towards you. And I'm going to superintend it towards you and to empower you to do that. So you won't be doing it on your own. I'll be doing it through you. And here the, uh, um, the proud is the one who, uh, and I deal with these people on, on uh, different media platforms all the time, and it's, it's sad, really, um, when they always go back to, well, what about, what about works? What about works? What about them? We were created in Christ Jesus for good works to walk in them. And we should walk in them. But it's a result of his saving us and his changing us, his making us new, his giving us a new perspective, his redeeming us and regenerating us and making us new. It's because we've all of a sudden found out we love him. And the more we walk in and abide in him, the more we love him and the more uh, desirous we are of doing these things. But he says, against everyone who is proud and lofty, and against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be abased. That is the idea of being humiliated before God. Then it says in verse 13, and it will be against all the cedars of Lebanon that are lofty and lifted up, against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, against all the hills that are lifted up, against every high tower, and against every fortified wall, and all the ships of Tarshish, and against all the beautiful craft. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is the people who Isaiah is speaking to, they would have understood exactly what he was talking about. Um... How many of us remember the, the two towers there in New York? That was kind of a, a symbol of our power, of our influence, of our moxie in the world. The trade towers. The world trade towers. 
And when they came down, it excited something within us. Let's just say. But that was a symbol. And that's the idea that's being talked about here. When he's talking about the oaks of Bashan, he's not just talking specifically about the trees. They were um, the, the trees of Lebanon, the cedars. They were famous. They were world famous for their ability to use that wood for particular things. Um, those of you who work with wood know that there are different types of wood. There's hard woods and soft woods, and they all have different purposes. And there are certain things that you could do with cedar that you couldn't do with oak and some of the harder woods, some of the more uh, hard woods that, that are out there. So you have to have certain wood for certain things. And so this was the idea of something that somebody from Lebanon and these Judeans would have been very familiar with this idea. This is something that they would be familiar with. Yeah, the cedars of Lebanon. Those are awesome, man. Those are amazing. And then they associate it with their identity. That's part of who they are. Well, I'm from Lebanon, where we have those beautiful cedars. Or the oaks of Bashan. Oak is a very strong wood. And uh, sometimes if you, believe it or not, on pallets, oftentimes they'll use oak for pallets because it's strong. It can hold up a lot. Very dense. There's more denser and harder woods, but it's one that's very commonly used. And the oaks of Bashan, same idea here. It's something that you took pride in. It's something that you look to. It's something that you could identify with and see. And this is the idea that is going on here, the lofty mountains. Um, the lofty mountains and the hills are lifted up. One thing to keep in mind with those trees, mountains, hills, what do they have in common? Every single one of those things. They're high. They're what? They're high, yes. But who made them? God. They have forgotten much like we have in this country. Who made this? Who made us with these abilities to build two towers that go way into the sky? Who gave us that ability to think in those ways, to be able to do this, to give us those skills? And if you go back into Genesis after the fall, you see that, that uh, and even uh, when they were um, uh, coming out of uh, Egypt and they were ready to start building the tabernacle, God had put his spirit into certain groups of, of men and, and women to make them artisans. And when you look back on the things and the abilities that you can do, um, and I think of uh, a lot of um, some of these NBA players, as great as Michael Jordan was at uh, playing basketball, I've never ever once in my entire life, I've never once heard Michael Jordan Give glory to God for his abilities. It's always about how hard he worked. It's always about what he did. It's always about his honing his talents. And that's the idea that's going on here. They've forgotten who to really glorify. Thank you, God, that I'm able to do this. If you're strong, thank you, God, that you've made me strong. If you're nimble and quick, thank you, God, that you've made me this way. Let me hone that steel so that It'll glorify you. They had forgotten that. And that's the idea. They had forgotten the creator of those things. Who made the cedars? Who made the oaks? Who made the hills and the mountains? God did. And that's what happens when we're so caught up in our own lives, in our own sin, and in the, old, the things that distract us from God, we forget to give him glory. We totally space it off. And not only do we Space it off. At first, it's just little by little. And then it's a little bit more, and a little bit more we forget. And then before you know it, it's all about you. You've forgotten. It happens. And it happens in our walk. Sometimes we go through dry seasons, and we have to, we have to uh, persevere through those times. I've, I've gone through those. And... Maybe some of you have as well. And when you do, you just have to always fall back on, it is written. Because then you're going back to, to who is telling you these things, to where you can remember these things. 
And it's not always about feeling. And unfortunately, sometimes we, we get caught up. I don't feel this. I don't, I don't feel like God is close to me. I don't feel like I'm close to God. Well, get back into this and let this build you up. So he says he's against all these, the oaks of Bashan, the, the lofty mountains, all the things that they look to. Now listen, now he's going to do uh, the, the works of their hands. Then he goes, and against every high tower. You build the high towers. You put your trust in them. I'm going to judge it. He's against their fortified walls. Those things that they built strong so that they could protect themselves. Again, remember part of uh, what was said uh, three to four weeks ago. That this was part of the problem. Is they were now trusting in their own strength. And when they didn't trust in their own strength, they were going, remember, to foreigners. To help them. And who was forgotten in that whole deal? The one that they should have gone to from the very beginning. They didn't. And so this is the idea here. Your strong towers, I'm going to be against them. Your fortified walls, I'm going to be against them. So their military might, it's going to be against. All the natural things around that he's provided, he's going to be against, that they look to. And then in verse 17, he says this, And the pride of men will be humbled. Oh, excuse me, verse 16. Against the ships of Tarshish. What does this represent? What does this represent? Trade, commerce, capitalism. These things that you've trusted in. Is it sounding like America yet? <laughs> yeah, kind of a warning sign here. Um, in the commerce and the things that they were able to do, the ships of Tarshish. Tarshish was known as a place from which people could get everything from. It was one of the centers of, of business in the old world. And one of the things that they did well was they built these ships. And in this case, when it says here um, that he's against all the uh, ships of Tarshish, the word there, ships, in the, uh, in the uh, Hebrew, the word uh, implies the idea of their salesmanship. Not their ability to sell, commerce, but their sailoring abilities. Their ability to... To, uh, they were very good at, out there on the seas. They were, they were a sea where, a fe, a fe, seafaring people in commerce. And not only that, he says, he says again, he's going to be against all those ships and their abilities to, to manage them, to steer them, to captain those ships. All those abilities that you have, I'm against them. And then he says, and, uh, um, and he says that against the beautiful crafts, and that is... Part of their abilities that they had to build these awesome ships, to be able to go and do their commerce. They could take them, their stuff and the trades to the world. They could sail to wherever they needed to go, and they built these wonderful ships. And the idea here is the craftsmanship with which they were put together. Again, leaning, man leaning on his people, leaning on their own two hands, leaning on their own strengths. Leaning on their own abilities. Leaning on their own talents. Having forgotten what? The God who gave them these things. It happens over and over again. And God says, I'm against that. I'm against those ships. I'm against your ability to do that. I'm against your ability to, to, to build those things. To marvelously craft them. And even these ornate things that they would do to these ships. Okay? He says, I'm against all that against all the beautiful craft. And then in verse 17, and the pride of man will be humbled. Man's pride. Now, is that to say if you uh, do, if you work with your hands and whether it's, you know, writing computer software or whatever, code or any of those things, or you're working with your hands, whether you're a gardener or whatever, working in wood, working in metal, um, is there anything wrong with taking pride in that? And the answer is no. Because so long as we're doing it through the proper channel. And it's not to say, you know, it's, it's not to say that we're channeling God, but it's, it's the idea of keeping it in perspective. There are some times when I get done with the job and some of the things that I do, and I can look back and say, man, I did a pretty good job on that. 
good. And I take pride in it. And I want to do good. Yeah. And I learned that from my dad. My dad said, if you're going to do you know, work, whatever you're going to work at, and many of us have heard it, pretty famous, whatever you do, do it, do it the best you can, as, as well as you can. But also, when, we're, when we have certain things that we uh, um, are, are very talented at, the talents that God gives us, we should do it and, and recognize those through the proper channel. And that is through the channel of God. Glorifying Him. If, if we're extremely good at something, then we should be thanking God. God, thank you for giving me the ability to do this. It's a talent. And some people say, well, it's a gift. Well, no. We're talking about, you know, there's a difference between spiritual gifts and talents that God gives. And He gives many of us talents. And uh, some, some people's talents are the ability to be able to read for hours and, and they just stay wide awake and wired. That's not my talent. <laughs> I wish it were, but it's not. Um, but whatever God has given, there's no, there's nothing wrong with glorifying Him in it. But here, their pride had risen. They were, they were trusting in themselves. They were looking to themselves. They were really prideful at this point. And he says, the pride of men will be humbled. That's a definitive statement. It's not something that might be, it could be. It wasn't a warning saying, hey, be, be careful. This was saying, no, you're, if you're proud, you're going to be humbled. Remember what the New Testament says, that, that God, um, he humbles the proud. But he lifts up the humble. That's the way that he works, when we're humble before him. Um, he does what the world doesn't understand. He takes the humble people, people of humble heart, and he lifts them up, and he knocks down the prideful. And then he says, and the, um, and the loftiness of men will be abased. There's a lot of lofty men out there. <clears throat> There's a lot of lofty women out there. A lot of them have governor attached to their name. Seen it. And it's just, I mean, the, the, the belittling and the way that they're um, addressing this issue is so uh, just crazy. It's, I can't make sense of it. When it's very simple things to, that they could do to, to, you know, just rectify the whole situation. But instead, they're choosing to, to make examples out of these poor people who are just trying to make a living. And they don't have any power. All they have is the power of their, of their voice, the power of the people. And we need to support those people. Um, he's speaking about that. He's speaking about the idea of the loftiness of men. When men lift themselves above others and lord it over them. He says, I'm going to be against that. And I'm going to send it crashing to the ground. They will all deal with these things. They will all have to deal with the idea of God one day reckoning the books. And we will stand alone. Stand alone. Except for those who are in Christ Jesus. But when we stand, He will be there with us in our stead. Like we talked about on Wednesday night. He will step forward as our advocate at that moment. And we won't be alone anymore. And we'll be in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And so he says, <clears throat> the loftiness of men will be abased and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. You see, that's what it's all about. If we exalt the Lord now, while we have opportunity to, we don't have to worry about not exalting Him in that day. And think about that. Just like it says up here in verse 11, the proud look of man will be, or, yeah, verse 11, the proud look of man will be abased, and the loftiness of man will be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. He's establishing a witness. It says, when I judge these things, 
Right. I alone will be exalted. In his judgment. That is one thing that is very difficult for Christians because we've been uh, uh, trained to believe and to only focus on the love of God. The love of God. The love of God. It's just the love of God. It's the love of God. God loves you. He loves you just the way that you are. And we're so focused on that in the church, we forget about these characteristics of God. Where he says, when I judge, and I judge rightly, and I judge justly, I will be exalted. Alone. Who's going to be exalting him? Well, he'll be exalting himself, number one. But we, as his people, we will be exalted in setting these things right. We will take joy in his judgment. If that scrapes against your, yourself, it should. Because it's removing the facade of this idea that, that this judgment of God is just a horrible thing. It's not. It's just is right. And then he says here, um, the Lord alone, in verse 17, the second part of verse 17, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. So that day is coming. And he's telling them, he says, in that day, he will be exalted. You will not. Your loftiness, your pride, it's going to be gone. It's going to be squashed. Okay? Just like in that song we were stomping. It's going to be stomped down. Verse 18. But the idols will completely vanish. Now here's an interesting idea. The idols. This is part of what the problem was. They were adulterating. They were whoring after other gods. They were, remember I said that they were syncretizing, trying to syncretize their worship. Including these false gods that they knew that they should know. They had all these little idols... And when the um, uh, when the uh, um, Dead Sea Scrolls came through several years ago, they saw these there. They they found them and they brought them. All these little tiny idols that people would have their little house idols. In our case, the idols that sometimes we put up on the dashboard. You know, our favorite uh, athlete. Um, some people are really crazy, and their favorite politician. And they stick it on their dashboard, the little bobbleheads, and you know, not like they worship it, like, you know. But it's that, that same idea, and they have these, and he says that the idols will completely vanish. Poof. It's the idea of, of they know that they're guilty, they know that they're going to be judged, and they're going to. All of a sudden, what, what idols are you talking about? We don't know what idols they're talking about. It's the idea of when, um, and many of us from our BC era, we were ever driving and partying with our friends, and all of a sudden we thought we saw a cop. <laughs> What's the first thing that happened? Those windows came down, and what? <laughs> Throwing out the evidence. In our stupidity. <laughs> Never thinking, hey, they have red lights, and they can see all this stuff. Um, that's the idea that's going on here. If I just get rid of this, he'll never know. Yeah. That's the idea that's going on. All of a sudden, they're just going to go, oh, what? what idols? I don't know what you're talking about. But he says, but the idols will completely vanish. And listen to this. He says, and men will go into caves of the rocks and into holes of the ground. They're going to toss their idols. They're going to go into these caves. Sounds very familiar from what Jesus said in uh, Matthew 24 and uh, Mark 13 and Luke 21. The men will do this. Mountains fall on us, hills crush us, whatever. Just don't let us have to deal with this God that's coming. And in that day, they will know. And here, in that day, he says, he says uh, um, that they'll, they'll, uh, the men will go into the caves in the rock of the rocks and into holes of the ground. Before what? Before the terror of the Lord. So they're running and hiding. Yeah. As if they could. <laughs> but that's how crazy it is. That's what happens. I mean, sin is illogical. It's irrational. 
And we do things like this, and then maybe if we just don't get caught with it, maybe we'll be all right. And maybe many of us used to say that. When you'd ask that, be asked those hypothetical questions. Is it wrong if, as long as I'm not caught, that's the worldly idea. That's the spirit of the age, right? If I'm not caught, then it's not wrong. No, it is wrong. It's especially wrong, because we know that it's wrong. And our conscience gives us away. But this is what the idea is. They, they would rather go into the caves of the rocks, hide themselves from the presence of the Almighty. That's why I said, when I think about this thing, even as, even as that someone who is trusting in Christ, it's still kind of terrifying to think about, man, I come before God. I don't know if I can deal with that in my mind. Truly, I can't. And it's that idea, but in this case, these guys were they were worshiping idols. And now they've tossed them, and they're, they're going into the holes of the ground. What are they leaving? They're leaving the comforts of their home. This is the desire. Not even that would be a comfort to them. Give me a hole in the ground. Give me a cave in the rocks. And then it says, and before, uh, before the terror of the Lord, that's what they're running from. There is a time coming when God will judge all things. Um, I want to take a moment here and turn to, uh, to Revelation. Revelation chapter 19, and verse, starting in verse 11. Um, all this stuff is unfolded. We get this picture that John gives us in the heavenlies, in the spirit. And this is what he says and what's recorded for us in uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. He says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. So at least there's a white horse in heaven. Whatever that white horse may be. And then he says, And he who sat upon it is called faithful and true. Hallelujah. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. Terrible. Lord of hosts. The idea of that military being unleashed, unleashed, waging war. That terror is what they're going to be fleeing from ultimately. That is a terror that men will want to hide from and will not be able to. And by the way, universally, everyone will know that God is God. If you read in some of these chapters in uh, chapter 16 and uh, chapter 15 and when all these things are being poured out that over and over and over again in fact I'll, I'll read it real quick before we continue on there um, let's see starting in verse 8 of chapter 16 the fourth bowl and this is what it reads and the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and it was given to scorch men with fire. And the men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God. What is this acknowledging? What is this teaching? They know who's doing this. They know where this is coming from. Universally. Yeah. And listen to what it says. They blasphemed the name of God. Kind of like what we're reading in Isaiah. Instead of Exalting the name of God. They're essentially blaspheming. He says, not only are they blaspheming the name of God, who has the power over these plagues. It's important. All they need to do is turn. All they need to do is turn. And in this case, this truly is turn or burn. Because they're being scorched. Okay? And it says, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. It's like, duh. You want, you want to be set free from this? Turn to him. Acknowledge him. Thank him. Praise him. Glorify him. Exalt him. Exalt in him. But they can't. They won't. Read a little further. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the throne of the beast. And his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And again, verse 11, and they blasphemed the God of heaven. Why? Because of their pains and their sores. And what? 
and they did not repent of their deeds. You'll read this more and more when you, when you go through those, but I want to turn back to Revelation chapter 19 to get this idea of this judgment, this one who's on this horse, this white horse who is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, it says here in verse 11 of chapter 19 of Revelation, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. That's important. John is explaining the war. See, here we have what's called the uh, just war. Um, no, I can't think of the last word. Uh, but uh, when we go to war, we want to be able to justify that it is a, a, a good reason to go to war. And we're told that there's never a good reason to go to war. Well, here, here there is. Here there's a perfectly good reason to go to war. And the one that's on the horse, who is called faithful and true, he is righteous, and he judges and wages war in righteousness. So it's a good war. And then he says in verse 12, and his eyes are a flame of fire. And I think what John was seeing there is that waging of war. It's that idea of somebody just inflamed with this fierceness, with this justice that is due. Yeah, it's ferocity. It's fierce. And his, his eyes are a flame of fire, so everyone that looks upon him will just be terrified. Is this scaring you yet? And upon his head are many diadems. He is the king of kings. So he has many diadems, many crowns. And he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. And those who believe that they know what that name is. There are those. Even though it says no one knows except him himself. Then it says in verse 13, And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called Logos. Theon. The word of God. That's his name. Hmm. Who could that be speaking of? The Logos. John is very familiar. That's how he opened up with that, with that phrase. He opened up his, his, uh, his gospel with that. That's who it is. He is the Logos, the word of God. And it says, an armies were, which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, uh, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Remember what Jesus said to uh, Pontius Pilate. He said, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would what? They would fight. We're warriors in heart as God's people. This is what is the idea, this army which is in heaven, and remember, one angel in one night killed 185,000 people. Warriors. One night. Gone. They put their heads down on their pillows for a moment, and that was all. That was all she wrote. They went into judgment. And there's a whole army coming? This is an ugly scene. <coughs> when we think about it, give it time. The armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations. Man, he's just going to call judgment. Boom, out. Bam. Just like he spoke, let there be light. And boom, there was light. He's going to call the same thing justice at that moment. It says, from his mouth a sharp sword comes, and so with it um, he may smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. The Almighty. The wrath of God. You see, God is, he does have that characteristic. He has a right to be wrathful and angry. Sometimes I warn people um, that don't want to believe in Christ. And or they want to trust in their own good works and so on and so forth. And I said, how, how insulting is it that Jesus' work on the cross is not enough? You think God would be pleased with that? He sent you his 
most prized possession. And he was mocked. He was treated like he did, and it was the most sinful thing that man has ever done in the history of mankind to take this perfect lamb and do to him what we did and to reject that. You think God will just be happy with you? Oh, that's okay. You just didn't truly understand. No. He will be full of wrath. And he's going to unleash the wrath. The fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robes and on his thigh he had a name written. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So this is the idea. Let me read the verse 17 real quick. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried out with a loud voice. Now that's just a weird thing right there. Because the way that it reads, he's standing in the sun. Okay? Um, and he's calling out. This angel that's standing in the sun, and he cries out with a loud voice, saying, uh, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, in order that you may eat the flesh of the kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of the mighty men, and the flesh of the horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, and small and great. That's pretty terrifying. That is pretty terrifying. That this is what's going to happen. And so I want to turn back now to Isaiah so we can finish that. But this is the idea, you see. And that's the idea of what God is intending here with these people. And thank God that he always has a remnant. Thank God that he always saves some. Praise God for that. And he says, in that day, listen to this, he says, when he arises to make the earth, uh, um, let me finish in the middle of uh, verse 19 here. He says, they're going to flee from before the terror of the Lord, from before the splendor of his majesty. We get to long to see it as believers. We don't have to be terrified of it. We get to long to see it, his majesty. And we will see him in his majesty and in his glory. And then it says, um, when he arises to make the earth tremble. Verse 20, in that day men will cast away to the moles and the bats, both unclean animals, um, their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship. That which was most precious to them. That which they made with their own hands with their own skills that God had given them. They turned from God, turned to idols that are dead, can't do anything, and they would cry to them. That funny picture in Isaiah over and over again, he says this, and it's kind of God in a, uh, um, in, a in a way just kind of poking fun at it. You cut a tree and half of it, you cook your meals and you do all, build all this stuff, and the other half you, you build an idol with it. Set it in your house and you cover it with gold and you bow down to it and you worship it, you cry out to it. And it doesn't hear you. It doesn't see you. It can't act. It can't do anything. It's dead. He says, This is your foolishness. When he arises to make it in that day, they're going to cast these, these, these uh, things to the moles and the, the bats, their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they had made for themselves to. So we can get things in our lives that we worship. And they can get in the way. And we have to be careful of that. I like what, uh, I think it was Martin Luther that said we're, we're idol making factories, all of us. Every single one of us. We make idols all the time. We have to be very careful not to do that. And so we have to be looking. Am I making an idol of this? They were making these things for them to worship. And then he says in verse 21, in order to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. And notice this is written twice. What's he doing here? What's he do whenever he mentions things twice? What's the purpose of that with the law that they would understand? 
It's a witness. Legally, it's a witness. Here's what's going to happen. He's setting up a witness to them. This will come to pass. This is why he does these things sometimes twice and sometimes three or four times. Um, in order to go to the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs, it's kind of a tongue twister there, before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. And then he says in verse 22, he says, stop regarding man. Stop. Stop regarding man whose breath is in his nostrils. For why should he be esteemed? What's the idea that's being passed here again? There's a man who's created. And you're looking to him. And he's just a mouth breather like you. And that's all. And you both have one creator. You have one creator. That's who you should esteem. That's who you should regard. They hadn't done it. And then you'll see there in verse uh, chapter 3 it says, For behold. We were not going to go there this morning, but uh, or this afternoon, but you see that it carries on, the idea, the teaching. I know this is kind of heavy, but remember, I've tried to sprinkle in there for those who are his, because that's our hope. Otherwise, we should be terrified. We should be horrified and mortified at the idea, but instead, we're mortified at our sin, because he has supernaturally changed us. He's given us a new identity. For those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's what he died for. To give us a new identity. I love what Paul says in Romans. Where he says there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I love that. And what we talked about Wednesday. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Those who he's elected to save. He's saved. They're saved. They're saved. Past tense. It's a done deal. We spent time talking about he who began a good work in you will finish it to the day of Christ Jesus. That's the idea. The work that he began, he's not going to leave it. He doesn't do that. He'll perfect it. He'll continue to work in and through us. But first, we have to come to Christ. We have to understand that we are sinful. We are guilty. And we're deserving of his wrath. And we can turn to him. And we can ask him to forgive us. We can ask him to come. If we just come by faith. And it's all by faith. It's by his grace we're saved through faith. And that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. And not of works lest anybody should boast. It's that simple. This judgment that will come one day. We're talking about the judgment here in, in history where he was having to judge his people. And I believe in one sense that it does, God loves his people so much that this does in one sense. Um, he doesn't take pleasure in that idea of having to do this. But he has to. And so he does. So if you've never given your life to Christ, give it to him. Commit your life to him. Receive him. And be set free. Let go of that. that, uh, that you don't let go of that big burden that's on your back. When you do, it just falls off. And it's no longer there. Hallelujah. And he sets you free. And he begins this work in you. He changes you. And it's only through Christ. And Christ alone. And there is no other way. God will be glorified. He'll be magnified and he'll be exalted in that day. And we'll be cheering him on. As uneasy as that sounds when we're talking about judgment. As horrifying as that chapter was, that portion of how he's going to just wage war. As horrible as that is, it's wonderful on our side because all our enemies will be put to justice. And praise God that there is that. Praise God that in his judgments, he is just, and he doesn't do anything capriciously. He does things because 
he is just. I want to finish with these uh, couple of, of uh, um, verses. In Job chapter 40, verses 1 through 14. I want to read this as quickly as I can. This time is getting short. Um, in Job chapter 40, verses 1 through 14. Then the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. Then Job, an Job answered uh, the Lord and said, Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my, mouth, my hand on my mouth. Shut my mouth. Once I have spoken, and I will not answer. Even twice, and I will, not, uh, I will add nothing more. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm and said, Now gird your loins like a man. I will ask you, you instruct me, will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Or do you have an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with eminence and dignity and clothe yourself with honor and majesty. Pour out the overflowings of your anger. And look on everyone who is proud and make him low. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. And tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them in the dust together. Bind them in the hidden place. Then I will also confess to you that you that your own right hand can save you. Pretty challenging words. God is saying, if you can do it yourself, do it. And finally, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 28, this is the order of the resurrection. It says now, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, and the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as an Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Now that all has an audience. We talked a little bit about this Wednesday. It's not saying everybody in the world. We're not universalists. The Bible doesn't teach that. So it says when all will be made alive. He says, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end. And this is what I want to focus on. When he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when he has established all rule and authority and power and we see our memory verse it's all been given to him he says for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet kind of what we read about in Revelation the last enemy that will be abolished hallelujah is death hallelujah no more death in that day for those who are Cancer, no problem. Corona, forget about you. All these things, gone. Death will be abolished. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him. It's a lot of subjecting. Here's the purpose. So that God may be all in all. He will be exalted. He will be exalted. Make no mistake. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your mercy and your kindness. Thank you for what is written. Many things terrifying and horrific to think about were it not for the saving sacrifice of the cross. Lord, we thank you. We glorify and preach the cross, acknowledge the cross. The perfect lamb paid that price and it was perfect. And our blood that was spilt cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Thank you. We praise you. We bless you. That one day you will deal with your enemies. Father, I pray.
pray that you would draw those who are yours, and that you would turn them, and that they would hear that there is forgiveness, that there is redemption, that there's reconciliation, and that there's wholeness, and that it is only found in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whose amazing, powerful, and holy name we pray, and we thank you. Amen.
Father in heaven, thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. Thank you that all authority has been given to Jesus. Yes. Authority to lay down his life and the authority to take it up again. And that you and your son are one. Yes. Thank you for this great gift, this forgiveness of sin. Yes. And thank you for revealing yourself to us. As our sins have been placed. Thank you for this great gift. Now be with us through the rest of the day. Father, we pray that you are worshipped in spirit and in truth in this place. You are honored and glorified. We love you. We worship you and praise you. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.